Hello. Welcome to this live recording of the Axe Files with John Stewart. I have the privilege of introducing this event to you today, a task which necessarily entails introducing you to someone you already know. You know John Stewart. You know that as a political satirist and comedian, Stewart has affected macro level shifts in our political culture, one example being the explosion of satirical programming from Daily Show alumni. You know that John Stewart's precision and focus produce more discreet changes, like getting Crossfire off the air and passing the Sajoga bill. You also know, I'm sure, of some really, really microscopic permutations in our shared world that John Stewart has affected. One such microscopic change is that John Stewart got me into U Chicago. <laughs> I wrote my application essay comparing John to Shakespearean fool in both his ability to speak truth to power and position as interpreter and voice of reason for the audience. <laughs> that comparison might not make much sense to anybody who didn't spend every summer at Shakespeare camp. Thanks, mom and dad. But I think we all know how John Stewart made us feel when we watched him skewer the news. We felt smart when we got the jokes. We felt understood when John articulated the things we had been thinking. We felt catharsis. That's why it's strange for me to stand here today and introduce John Stewart to you. You know him. He's been an integral part of not just our internal lives, but the way our entire media sphere has grown and changed over the past decade. I can tell you unequivocally, I wouldn't be where I am today without John Stewart. You know him. And guess what? You're about to meet him. Without further ado, let me introduce Institute of Politics founder and Axe Files host David Axelrod in conversation with the man who did not need this introduction, John Stewart. <laughs> And now, from the University of Chicago Institute of Politics and CNN, The Axe Files, with your host, David Axelrod. Now you can Very say, quick. this is how Jews meet all the time. <laughs> when, when people aren't paying attention, we sneak into churches and just chat. That's, <laughs> that theme song, by the way, was actually the original John D. Rockefeller theme music. So uh, yeah, you got to be a rich the oligarchs walk to have your own theme called, music. Yes. So, John, I have to ask you, yep. where you been, man? Me? There's, yes. There's a lot going just, on I've, out here. I've been in line. I was out in line, <laughs> out front. <laughs> was, uh, do, you, uh, do you wake up ever and say to yourself that this was some kind of big celestial joke on you that you announced your retirement from The Daily Show? And uh, I, I see when you did, you said, it didn't appear that there was going to be anything wildly different about this election year. You had done four <laughs> others. Uh, how's that working for you now? Well, I mean, I think we, we talk about it as though it's something incredibly different, but in truth, how, how different is it, really? I mean, uh, the media is, as usual, focused on the wrong things and abdicating responsibility for the general uh, filtration of toxicity. Uh, you have enormous amounts of money flowing into crazy people who uh, are, are channeling uh, populists of years past. So I don't, you know, if you took Sarah Palin's head and jammed it onto D Donald Trump's body, would it make any more sense? Probably not. Look a little weird, though, I think. I don't know that it would look any weirder. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, on that point, you, you once said, I assume there are bad actors in society. It's inherent in politicians to be disingenuous. I assume monkeys are going to throw shit. I get angrier at people who don't go, bad monkey. Uh, or uh, Wait, I said create that? a distraction that allows it to be continued unabated. Yeah. How, how responsible is the media for Donald Trump? Oh, I don't, look, listen, uh, I don't necessarily believe that uh, a full court press on his uh, untruthiness would necessarily change it. I mean, he's not, he was voted for. But I do think he is generally uh, 
the conclusion to years of, he makes sense if you view it through the prism of talk radio. Uh, I like to drive. And so I listen to talk radio and it is 24 seven of your country is being taken away from you. As far as I can tell, the conservative side or on the right side, they feel an ownership over America. They are the stewards of America. They are its With forebearers. Yeah. Exactly. Republicans, conservatives love America. They just hate like 50% of the people living in it. So <laughs> in general, isn't part of their concern that that 50% is becoming or whatever percent is becoming a greater, we're becoming a much more diverse country. Sure. So yeah, no, nativism. Look, this is, it's not as though this is inherent only to this country as well. Globalization has created this strange pushback throughout the entire world. You see a lot of countries retreating into nativism, mm -hmm. uh, into that type of really... In fact, there are uh, Trump-like characters all over Europe in different countries. Yes, right yes. He is, it's very similar to, I don't know if you ever saw Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It's very <laughs> similar. Uh, but no, it's, in some ways, it's, it's a natural reaction to fear. Now, if you have that fear stoked on a daily basis at an incredibly high pitch, and this is not, we really need to do something about this country. Uh, we're facing some difficult problems. This is, you are run by a tyrant. He is going to take away your rights. Uh, we are falling. There are rapists and murderers at the border coming to kill you. If that's what you've been fed and that's what you're buying into, Donald Trump makes more sense than anybody else out there because he's going, great, let's build a, uh, the, the, the Visigoths are out the gate. Let's build a fucking wall and not let it. It makes total sense. What wouldn't make sense are the general Republican leadership going, there are Visigoths at the wall, they are here to kill you. Let's try and <laughs> not pass a new budget resolution. You know, yeah. that's, their rhetoric has never matched their action. Donald Trump is saying, oh, that's your rhetoric? Then yeah, let's, Although, let's you build know, there a wall. Is a, there's a weird paradox in both his message and their attacks, which is on the one hand, they say, well, the dictator is, uh, is uh, is encroaching and threatening. Uh, on the other hand, their critique of the president is that he's feckless. And it's hard to be a feckless dictator. Are you suggesting, Groucho Marx and Duck Soup, Are you, you know? suggesting, sir, <laughs> that there may be slight cognitive dissonance? Well, <laughs> is that what you're suggesting? Because well, I will not sit here some and be told, look, I don't even know that Donald Trump is eligible to be president. And, and that's not a birther thing. That's, I don't know, look, I'm not a constitutional scholar, so I can't necessarily say, but can you, are you eligible to run if you are a man baby? Or a, uh, <laughs> uh, a, a, a baby man? A, uh, see, I don't know what the, look. I don't know, and again, I'm not here to be politically incorrect. I, 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 if they're referred to as man baby Americans, uh, <laughs> but he is, he is a man baby. He uh, has the physical countenance of a man uh, and a baby's uh, temperament and hands. So, <laughs> so to have that together, I mean, for God's sakes, I, I, I should speak. Uh, so I do have a history with the man. And so in, in, in an effort of full disclosure, uh, we made fun of him. <laughs> and... Uh, I think we refer to him as, you know, a boiled ham in a wig or something. Who knows? Uh, and so he tweeted at me because, as you know, great leaders tweet. Tweet. Yes. Late at night. In yes. fact, I remember uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg tweet storm <laughs> uh, after he delivered. Uh, That's why the address was so short. He had to do it in 140. Yes. Yeah. Well, he, after the Gettysburg address, he, he tweeted out, emancipate this motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> So Donald Trump uh, tweeted John Leibowitz. He, he thought uh, he's going to use my birth name. your name? Leibowitz, yes. yes. John Stuart Leibowitz is my, Jonathan Stuart Leibowitz, my full name. He was going to tweet that, and then he tweeted out, uh, be proud of your heritage. Don't run away from who you are. By the way, he's overrated. Or something, or something along those lines. Incisive. It's very incisive. Yeah. And, uh, and so we 
thought, well, geez, uh, let's, let's answer. <laughs> so uh, we tweeted back to him, uh, Donald Trump's real name, uh, which I don't know if you even know this, is Fuckface Von Clownstick. <laughs> And the research you guys must do on that show is unbelievable. Yeah. We have people, <laughs> Lexus Nexus, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and so we wanted to know why he was running away from the Von Clownstick uh, heritage. And we got into this, this huge fight. And this. Did he sue you? He, te he tends to sue for people for things like that. Yeah, I mean, I I'm just, I don't know that a man baby can be president. He's, he's character is destiny. And he is the most thin-skinned individual. And look, you've been around politicians. You know they're thin-skinned. You know yeah. President Obama, for all his qualities that you love, gets angry. And certainly I've, I've borne Irritated, the, br the brunt of that at times. Yes, I've, um, heard, I've heard. Yes. And, uh, but I don't know that he has, and they keep saying, which I think is the most wonderful thing, don't worry, when he becomes president, he's going to be totally mature. And, uh, well, he says, he said, being presidential is easy, and he'll do it at right. the appropriate time. But what does that say about your constituency if what you're saying to them is, look, the only way that I can win this part of the race is by being an unrepentant, narcissistic asshole, because that's what my, my voters like. But once I have to appeal to everybody, I'll be cool. Yeah. But the fact is that you look at all these exit polls from primary after primary, and the big number that he commands is he tells it like it is. He says stuff other politicians aren't willing to mm -hmm. say. And, uh, and you, you, know, you spoke earlier about people who, uh, who are frightened you know, because of these changes in the economy that have left them without the kind of uh, future that they thought they would have, and they're eating that up. Right, but that, again, and, and this gets to the point of... Authenticity is what they say. This gets to the point, though, of the press versus the campaign. And what we see in the press is they're covering the campaign, but they're not covering veracity or, you know, so the exit polls say this is what people think, then someone in the press has to come out and go, wow, people must be assholes because that's not okay to think. You know, it's not... It's not okay to have nostalgia for the madmen society and think that that, is, that that ignorance is virtue. And they have twisted this around so that his ignorant pronouncements are somehow uh, a sign of great character. It's like where I grew up when people go like, hey, look, no disrespect. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying your mother's a whore. I'm saying, and you're like, I think that's what you're saying. The difference is he would and, just say your mother's a whore. Right. But when he says, you know, people are so nervous. See, here, here's what's so amazing about this. So the whole idea of political correctness is everybody's so sensitive. Just get over it. You know, why should uh, African Americans be so sensitive about police shootings? Why, why do they have to be so sensitive about uh, uh, years of systemic racism creating economic disparity? Come on. I'm not a slave owner. Donald Trump couldn't handle us making a joke about him. Vanity Fair, Graydon Carter did a joke about Donald Trump's hands 25 years ago. He's still not fucking over it. And his hands so, aren't any bigger. So Muslims, not true, by the way. <laughs> he actually did Finger a Finger extensions. Trump International. And if you see them now, they say <laughs> Trump and go left. <laughs> Bill. Um, but the, the idea being that Muslims, hey man, he does all he's saying is they're evil and shouldn't be allowed in this country. He's just telling it like it is. But God forbid you say happy holidays in December. It's fucking war. <laughs> so who is it who's exactly sensitive here? We're only talking about what are the trigger points. And the trigger points to me seem to be uh, on one side grounded in a certain reality of life that only those with no experience or empathy towards what those individuals are going through are having, and the other seems to be a clinging to a societal paradigm that just doesn't exist anymore and probably never did. When was America great? When, what, what is this time that he speaks of? 81 to 82? Like, what, what are we talking about? <clears throat> and who took your country away from you? Yeah. Whose country, whose is it? 
Yeah. Don't well, take up those, take up those... the argument with the founders. Take it up with the age of reason. That's the you know all men are created equal. That's fucked the whole thing up. Yeah. The uh, another thing that they I think the 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 people who are rallying to him would say. I mean, some of it is just. I think grounded in, in, in pure racism and nativism and all of that. But there also is a, the fact that the economy, you mentioned globalism, technology, mm -hmm. has made a lot of jobs obsolete that you right. didn't need a college education. These, these kids are going to do great. No, I don't, I don't know about well, that. Well, <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are three or four who aren't going to do great and you know who you are. Uh, they might do great or they might not. But, <laughs> but I mean, my point is this. They're, they're, uh, we haven't paid enough attention as a country to how we shepherd this change and make opportunity more broadly available. I think education is a piece of it. He's not speaking to that, but that's really the debate we should be having in this country is what are we going to do with this big revolutionary change uh, that has left a lot of people behind? Right, but you have a situation in government that makes that very difficult, if government is. The, the fallacy of this whole thing, and maybe it's a leftover from the Marshall Plan, and everything else, and, and the, 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 the nostalgia for the World War II era, is that America can actually control things in a matter that is tidy. This idea somehow that we can control, we live in a post-colonial world. We no longer have a Western frontier. Like, that's just reality. And globalization is not a question of American policy cannot, that box has been opened. And the problem with globalization is not that America hasn't handled it, is that corporate America would prefer money travels. People don't. So if they can send money to places where they can hire 100 people that'll work 12 hours a day for $2 versus 10 people that only work eight hours a day for $15 an hour, what are they gonna do? So this has nothing to do with- the argument Trump's been making. Here, but here's the real political incorrectness. If they really wanna be truthful, the problems in this country are not because of Mexicans and Muslims. And if they, wanna, if they want to in any way confront what's really going on, the problems in this country is you have one party in America whose sole purpose is to freeze the government and to not fix any of the problems that are associated with it. They have a great game going, which is government sucks and can't get the job done. And then they can sit as an impediment to that government and point to their destruction as evidence of their thesis. It's a great tautology. And it's, for whatever you want to say about the Democrats, maybe they're feckless, maybe they're, uh, uh, they, they focus too much on identity politics, or uh, uh, they're not fiscally responsible. At least they're fucking trying. Yeah, well, I'm not going to debate you on that. <laughs> um, you know what? You're not the same without the mustache. <laughs> I know, but thank God you took up the facial hair so we can still carry the torch out there. I appreciate well, uh, it. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Hillary Clinton, but Who? before we do, before we do, um, you're obviously, uh, you haven't lost your edge, you haven't lost your passion. Have you been restless watching this whole thing, uh, not having the platform that you had? Obviously, you can create a new one, and, and I want to ask you about whether you're about to create a new one. No, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not restless because uh, what I gained from leaving the show in perspective of when you are in that soup, it is very hard not to begin to think that the world functions on that currency. There's only two cities that I know of that are that arrogant, and that's D.C. and Los Angeles, where they truly believe, you know, and we saw it again with Larry at, Wilmore. At the White House. At the White House I want to ask Center. you about your reaction. Larry Wilmore did the White House Correspondence Center, and everybody went nuts. My God, he's done. With what? He's finished. He's not running for anything. He's not finished. He'll never get asked back. I don't think he gives a shit. Right. <laughs> you know, and when you watch the post-show analysis, it was all based on whether or not he had helped himself, how some of the room had read it, and not in any way... A little narcissistic an, there. But yeah. not only narcissistic, but in no way an examination of the foundation of what he was saying, mm -hmm. which is you are an incredibly corrupt and blinded symbiotic terrarium. 
Yeah, I don't understand why that message wasn't well received. <laughs> Here's the thing, not well received, not received. Yes. Not noticed. No, that's a, that's, yes. They did not notice yeah. it. What they noticed was, well, he didn't get that many laughs. He really bombed. Yeah. Well, that's the weird thing about the White House Correspondents' Dinner because yeah. there is this sort of strange symbiosis between Hollywood and Washington, and they're similar communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the actors come to Washington and love to mix with the politicians. The politicians love to mix with the actors. And there, you know, there is a, a narcissism about those two communities that is, uh, that is very much uh, the same. You did the dinner once, right, in 97? Yep. Mm -hmm. I did it right after Imus. And Imus famously, you know, made a joke, I guess, about Clinton's proclivities. And, uh, and again, they said... For diplomacy? Yes, for, for, uh, for reading, mostly. <laughs> um, I have to watch, you know, obviously we're in a church. There's only so far I can go. Um, <laughs> or actually, you know what? I'm out of his jurisdiction, so I can pretty much <laughs> say whatever I want. Um, he'd be ready to strike me down with lightning and be like, eh, it's not his house anyway. Um, I think that the problem is the system is incentivized in all the wrong directions. And right now, the system is incentivized in the way that a crack dealer is incentivized, which is it can do tremendous damage, but as long as people are buying crack, everything's good on his block. And, and I, really, I truly believe it's that corrosive and corrupt. When you have the presidents of networks saying Trump is good for business, when you have the lead anchor of Fox News having to go to Trump's hotel to make him stop being mean to her, and now he says she's terrific because they've had a detente, that's fucked. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know how you describe, you know, there are heads of networks who have said Donald Trump is great for business. Well, why would you kill the thing that's great for business. Well, I asked why you at the beginning, even, and you why were, would you even say what it was? I asked you at the beginning, and you were sort of dismissive about what the role of the media has been. But what you're suggesting is that there is, an, uh, they have a pecuniary interest in the, the Trump story. Correct. Well, I, I think what I was responding to about the role of the media is, can they solve it on their own? Mm -hmm. But look, television journalism was ahead of the game at the Nixon-Kennedy debate. You know, that, that, that's when the television mediums That was a while came, ago. Came into, right, I was there, you were there. Yeah, um, we were pages. Came into effect. Basically, Kennedy understood it a, a little bit rudimentary. He thought, I should probably wear makeup. And Nixon was like, I look great. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> he went out there and, you know, everybody thought he had hepatitis and that was the end of his game. <laughs> Since then, an entire industry has risen up as to how to manipulate and skew that medium to the advantage of the politicians and the powerful. And the industry, rather than in some ways creating a counterweight to that, have been subsumed by it. And so now it's a symbiosis. The media is no longer predator and prey, which I think is, should be the relationship, but a remora that's just attached underneath, hoping for crumbs that fall off of the shark. Though they do, I mean, I watched uh, uh, Trump with George Stephanopoulos yesterday, mm -hmm. who tried to probe, I don't know if you saw the show, but he was uh, probing him on his various proposals, and Trump said, you know, he said, you know, your tax plan would be a windfall for the wealthy, and Trump said, well, it is now, but once we negotiate, it won't be anymore. Mm -hmm. And just basically shedding all of, of right. his uh, position. So, but he's being challenged. He's just, he's no, just. But it's, it's, you're talking about singular anecdotal moments. You're talking about floating logs in a torrent. You know, the relentlessness of the cycle requires an equal counterweight. It can't, it, a counterweight does not mean that occasionally, you know, you, you push back to a small extent as the waters rush by you everywhere else. That's, I think, where Fox has an advantage is that they understood that to take over the cycle, you need to be relentless. You need to be perpetuating uh, your point of view and your propaganda in the same way that people consume it, which is 
constantly and self-reinforcingly and over and over and over again. Which and seems unless to be, you have something is, pushing back with that same force, you're not going to have any balance. Well, the interesting thing about this election, though, you say it's not much different. Trump has basically embraced that tactic. I mean, he is relentless. He is ubiquitous. He is out there all the time. He's, he's just learned how to, he's just doing judo against them. What, what works for 24-hour network? What, what is it incentivized for? It is incentivized for, here's what you would want it to be incentivized for, clarity. It is incentivized for what? Conflict. The voices that are amplified are the ones that are the most conflict-oriented, the most extreme. Those are the guys that get the airtime. So if they're incentivized for conflict, Trump is not playing this like everybody keeps talking about. He's amazing. He's not, this is the first season of Survivor. <laughs> this, is, it's, it's, this is reality show 101. Right, right. I'm going to be an enormous dick at the beginning of the show to get all this attention. And then once I make it to final counsel, then I'm going to reveal, he's, uh, what's the guy's name? Johnny Fairplay. He's Johnny Fairplay. He's the guy who said, oh, my grandmother died, and don't vote me out. And then finally, when he got to the, the, the final tribal council, that's, that would, that's what he's playing. What, uh, uh, talk to me about Hillary Clinton as an opponent to him. And, and, and I've what, never what run you, against her, so I don't what, you, uh, what, what, what would you be saying about her if you were doing your... Show right what I think about Hillary Clinton is, uh, you know, I imagine to be a very bright woman without the courage of her convictions, because I'm not even sure what they are. So I, I would suggest that when I watch her campaign, when I watch her campaign, it reminds me of, and again, I'm throwing out references that mean absolutely nothing to anybody. So I, I will continue to do that. Uh, she reminds me of Magic Johnson's talk show. And I won't say anything. Again, you have that thought too, huh? If you ever watch Magic Johnson's talk, Magic Johnson was a charming individual, but he wasn't a talk show host. And when you watched his show, you could almost see Arsenio's advice to him in real time rendering. So he would sit and he would go, uh, my first guest tonight, oh, Arsenio said enthusiasm is something that Sal is, uh, my first guest tonight is, share everybody! <laughs> But it never seemed authentic and real to his personality. It seemed like he was wearing uh, an outfit designed uh, by someone else for someone else to be someone else. And that is not to say that she is not preferable to Donald Trump, because at this point, I would vote for Mr. T over Donald Trump. <laughs> but. But she will, I think she will be in, in big trouble if she can't find a way. And, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe a real person doesn't exist underneath there. I don't know. You, did you, you worked, uh, you, you dabbled on the government side when you were advocating for the Zadroga Act for 9-11 uh, survivors. Did you work with her when she was senator of New York on that? No. So you never I worked any... with uh, Chris and Gillibrand. Mm -hmm. I see. So who's, who's, she was out of the Senate by then. She's terrific. Kristen Gillibrand is, is terrific. She, so Hillary was out of the Senate by then. Yeah, have you, you must have had her on your show. Yes. And what was that like? Really cool. <laughs> it's, uh, look, huh. there are politicians who are either rendering their inauthenticity in real enough time to appear authentic, and then there are politicians who render their inauthenticity through, it's like when your computer, you want to play, if you have a Mac and you want to play a Microsoft game yes. on it, yes. and there's that weird lag. Yes. That's, no, I mean, that's, I, that's, I think that's a big problem. There's like a seven second delay and all the words come out in a perfectly politically right. calibrated sentence. Right, now what gives me hope in that is that there's a delay, which means she's somehow fighting something. I've seen politicians who don't have that delay and render their inauthenticity in real time, and that's when you go, that's a sociopath. The, uh, <laughs> that's an uplifting message there. The, um... By the way, it, as far as uplifting messages, I have never in my life experienced what I experienced in my one day of lobbying down in Washington, yeah, D.C. And let me just say, like, for however I painted it on the show, it's so much worse than you could possibly imagine. 
it is a cesspool. There are some good people trying to survive within the lava, but it's, it's a fucking horror show. No, no disrespect. No. <laughs> There is Just the fact that you're at the Institute of Politics where we're trying to encourage young people to get into the Can public I say this? Uh, arena. Get, in, get into it and don't, be, don't get it on you. I've never, I was down there with firefighters who had spent a year on the smoldering remains of the World Trade Center. The guy that I was with, Ray Pfeiffer, had a titanium rod in his leg that was breaking because of the metastasized cancer that was roiling through it, that he got from being on the pile. We had the scientific evidence with us. You cannot imagine the disrespect, the lack of compassion that was exhibited towards this man and this cause by individuals in higher office, it was, I will never recover from it. So here's my, here's my theory, because I can't sit in front of a, a thousand young people and not say this. You know, it, it, uh, you have to, if you turn away and you walk away from this and you just seed, seed all of that to the people you're talking about, you're going to get what you get. And it seems to me that there's some obligation to go in there and try and change it. So you say, go in there and don't get it on you. Yes. But uh, we need that. We need no, that. But, this but is the most When I say don't get it on you, of. I don't mean don't engage. I mean take appropriate precautions. Wear a hazmat <laughs> suit. Wear, <laughs> bring your ideals. I have, whenever I speak to, and we used to do this thing every year where we'd bring the press secretaries for all the Senate and all the House people that wanted to come in. And they would say to me, so what can my candidate do to have a successful appearance on your show? <laughs> and I would say he could or she could say what she thinks about the issues concerning America. And they said, is there any other uh, way right. to do it? But they, they would say, but what would you, what should I tell them? What works best when people say, what they believe. What's that? <laughs> yeah, and, and honestly, like, I know you think that I'm being hyperbolic. I recognize that you don't understand this. I am not. It, they are as unaware of their own machinations as you could possibly imagine. It's, and I'm not even saying it's malevolence. It's the way the game is played. It's, I assume that it's survival. But you must have met people cult. over the course of, uh, from 99 to last year doing this show. Mm -hmm. uh, you must have run across people who, who did, who were disarming and. Sure, no, I, I, I must have. <laughs> Do you want a few seconds to think about that? Yeah, hold on. <laughs> um, there are people that were, what I would get there is the same thing I would get in the news industry, which is people would pull you aside and they would say, yeah, man, it sucks. It's so, you're, it's, you're absolutely right. It's terrible down here. And you would just go, hmm. Yeah, but, you know, again, I don't, I don't want to sit here as the, the, the sort of defender of a, of a system that is badly broken. Right. But there are people who, who do make a difference. Down Every there. day. You mentioned uh, Kirsten Gillibrand. There are others who sure. actually go there and try to you know. The amount of energy that you have to expend. I'll just go along with the 9-11 bill. This is as no-brainer as you can possibly get. This is a horde of zombies would stop their brain-eating rampage to go, yeah, those guys should so, get some health care. That makes yeah. sense. So run out and find so, a horde of zombies? So these guys, for nine years, had to travel with cancer, with mesothelioma, with uh, low lung function, with heart failure. Nine years of incessant lobbying to move this body. And it only through their lobbying efforts and some measure of public shaming, they relented in the most condescending of ways to finally give into it. 
if it takes that effort to do something that easy, it, it is a system that must be, uh, it is self-perpetuating in a way that is, that is dangerous yeah. at this point. You know, I, but I saw, you know, I saw, and you were there uh, doing your thing, uh, I saw people cast votes for the Affordable Care Act who mm -hmm. lost their who lost their positions, people who voted for uh, cap and trade to try and do something about climate change, who sure. lost their positions. And, right. and we should, and there are some who didn't, but we should at least acknowledge that those, there are those people who are willing to do that. I always say profiles and courage was a thin volume for a reason, okay? Right. It's not the norm, but it's something that we should. Uh, I guess my point is, is why in, in God's name should that be courage? In what world is taking a political stand and trying to affect legislation that should be... And by the way, what's incumbent on those who believe government can make a difference in people's lives is to try and make it more efficient. And I think that's where the Democrats fail in an enormous way, is that in their world, if, if you believe that government can make a difference in people's lives, well then make the bureaucracy work more efficiently make the regulations that are strangling you know, uh, uh, small businesses. Don't just open the Fed window at 0% to corporations. Force them at some level to at least give a percentage of that to small business loans. I mean, th and I understand that, that they are trying, but, and, and you and your boss and I had a, 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 a big argument about this, but the VA. If you can do an executive order to kill an American citizen from above with a missile. How can you not do an executive order to reevaluate the DOD and the VA system so that you don't spend a billion dollars trying to get two computer programs to talk to each other when probably three of these idiots could do it for $500? <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't wash. Yeah. And at some level, and I'll lay the blame then with the Democrats. The door is open to an asshole like Donald Trump because the Democrats haven't done enough to show to people that government that can be effective for people can be efficient for people. And if you can't do that, then you've lost the right to make that change and someone's gonna come in and demagogue you. Yeah. And that's what happens. I, I, I don't know, John, that it's that the people who are following Trump are following him because of efficiency. I think there are other oh. elements there are other no I don't question. disagree with you. I've always said this, that we ought to be committed to uh, uh, ends and not means. And if the means don't work, then change them, you know. Uh, I think that's challenging government is, is something that Democrats should do. But on the other hand... Let me ask you a question. On the other hand, is me, government too big to manage? Uh, it's a very, there's a, that's a very good question. And I think that what I think, <laughs> what, what I, what I think, what I think happens is... We've got a country of 330 million, so government's going to be uh, large. What I think happens is <laughs> bureaucracy builds on bureaucracy, and it gets encrusted on top of itself. And we, right. especially in an age of uh, technology, there is an opportunity uh, to do things better and more creatively. And I think that, that government well, should do that. But let me say this. Let me right. just say a word yeah. on this, because yeah. um, I, I think before we're too cynical about this. This is not cynicism. Don't mistake. No, but let me don't let me, mistake this for cynicism. If you talk to one of the 20 million people who have health care today who didn't have health care, mm -hmm. they have a pretty positive view of government. Uh, you know, if you uh, talk to people who have a Pell Grant, or if you talk to people who are uh, finally, after all these centuries, enjoying their uh, full rights, gay and lesbian uh, uh, Americans, and certainly they, they feel positively at, uh, that 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 government has been on their side, at least, in mm -hmm. uh, recent years. So I think that um, it, is, it is a little bit too broad brush to say there's nothing, no progress has been made. Uh, right. No, nobody has... No I would definitely agree with you if that's what I had said. <laughs> but that's not what I said. Okay. What I said was, and I'll, to, to throw it back the other way, let me say this. Can you imagine how disconcerting it is for someone who's talking about the efficiency of government, to talk to the man who basically helped Barack Obama get elected, and you're a powerful guy, who has basically been part of the group that's been in charge of government for eight years, to say, yeah, you know, bureaucracy is bureaucracy, 
What are you going to do? And you're like, I don't know. Yeah, here's the thing, John. A government, yeah. uh, the, the system we have, and you wrote the definitive book on the U.S. Constitution, <laughs> so uh, I know you know this. The government right. we have uh, it, it is hard to move. We moved a lot in the first two years when Obama sure. was president. 2010 came along, and uh, there was a huge uh, tidal wave. And then, and we've had a situation where you have uh, a gridlock, not a gridlock, but a very divided sure. Congress. and the system is devised in such a way that it makes yes. it very difficult to get things done under that, uh, under that. No uh, question. So that's, you know, uh, yes, I would, I, I would have liked if, if we had come to office and we didn't have a, you know, massive uh, economic crisis and some of the other things, I would have liked to have concentrated on this project, which is how do you rationalize government for the 21st century? There are these projects going on within government, but it's very hard to turn it around. Right. So but all I'm saying is if people can see your reelection effort be incredibly agile, and I mean, I honestly, I'm still getting emails from the reelect Barack Obama, like sometimes through like the television. Like it, I don't know how you guys figured it out. But if you're, you're that- lag, You're laggard in your donations. If you're, if, you're that, if you're that agile for campaigning, why are we so good at campaigns and so bad at governance? Because campaigns, because yeah. campaigns, campaigns are not as complicated and not as challenging as government because you have full control over your campaigns. Let me tell you something, when we made a decision in, my camp, in our campaign, I didn't have to go and, and, and have Congress affirm it, okay? Right. We could just move. And so, so, it, so the government is not, the campaigns are not you government. Can't, you can't do, in the way that you use executive action, you can't use that against the bureaucracy. No, you can, and it has been done. And there have been a lot, there's been in, 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 in a series of different ways. Are you happy with the amount orders. that you guys did in that regard? I am, I am, uh, I am convinced that uh, had there not been the resistance we had in Congress, we could have done more. I, I, there's no question about that. You know, am I happy about So we about agree. It? Yes. <laughs> we, we agree except for this one point, which is... Yeah. Um, By the way, this is how we, Jews make love. This is... <laughs> this is... Just so you know, like, he and I, when we're done with this, thing, this is like eating latkes yeah, we're, on top of a dreidel miss, with, like... We're missing... Where's the corned beef? Jews, at, 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 the only thing that's missing is an uncle who's to the right of Genghis Khan but who could just walk in and go, Israel has a right to defend itself. <laughs> so I'm just, just pointing it out for those of you who are getting nervous. This is how we communicate. We had a guy like that standing right here a few months ago, but um, uh, no, I, I have to say. I don't go to school here, so I don't know what that means. No, no. Uh, the. Yeah. The, 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 it is, it's too facile to compare campaigns to government. The reason but, why I don't think it's facile is this. So, and again, I think it's, it's a part of, it's very easy to say, well, it's two different systems. Well, we're at the point in our government where if you can take extraordinary measures to fix a crisis like the bank bailout, mm -hmm. then you can take extraordinary measures to fix a crisis like crumbling infrastructure and bureaucratic nightmares. Yeah. I, I, you know, John, it's you can't by executive order fix crumbling infrastructure. You need money to fix crumbling infrastructure. Right, but you can You need a Congress fix, that's willing to work with you to you fix can crumbling fix infrastructure. some of the problems in contracting. You can fix that. Yes, you can do that, and that's some of that's point. been done. But, but the point is you can't fix through contracting a massive underfunding of infrastructure, no, which understand. is a battle that's been going on for years. But listen, we just got a couple minutes left. Oh. I just want to ask, I know you hate- Sagittarius. You, you deflect. <laughs> no, this was the, if you were a tree thing. Yeah. Um, you, you deflect questions about yourself. I have, t I have two, and one right. is, when you were growing up in Jersey, uh, you, you could not have imagined- hey, Wait, hold on a second. Thank you for that. That was- that was the appropriate amount of applause for New Jersey. When, you said when you were growing up in New Jersey, and literally, I just heard this. Like in the way you would if at the Masters, somebody sack a putt. Right, but you, you could not have imagined that you would be opining and, and you'd have the world hanging on your words on, 
on politics, on the social scene. I mean, this wasn't, you, you couldn't, this was not your life goal. It's important because I think kids, some kids are thought to believe that, taught to believe that they need to have a life plan. You didn't have a life plan to become what you are now. Uh, I did. Well, you had a kind of circuitous was, route to get there. I was raised in a laboratory, comedic laboratory. Um, I mean, I think I, I understand your point about protecting their innocence and their enthusiasm. Please don't misunderstand. Criti criticism is out of love and desperation. No, I, I totally get that. And, and no, I, I, I totally I'm, get in that. Fact, I'm in fact, I'm not pessimistic in any way because this country has proven resilient based on the fact that its foundation is the age of reason and the age of enlightenment. And that is going to be what carries us through. You know, we face darker times no, we have. than these. Much and, darker. And they have. These, these guys are going to make a difference. I think one of the things that's changing in this country is that young people are more tolerant, they're more aware, they're more, uh, they feel more rooted in the world and not just in their own lives. I think that these guys are going to change things, but you're deflecting again because you oh, won't okay. talk about yourself. All right. All right. So I'm going to give up. I'm not going to give. I'm going to give up the whole John Stewart story because we don't have time for it. But it'll be in a. You are missing out. It'll be a bookstore near you soon. But uh, I, sh I have to ask you about moving forward because yes. there've been uh, uh, HBO suggested maybe you would be engaging I'm not, in this. I'm election. not going to be on television anymore. I, the, the 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 whole point of. How are you? Old. Are you going to engage at all in this in this next uh, six months? Are we going to see John Stewart? I feel in like more I'm engaged ways? now. I mean, you know, the one thing I also want to make clear to people is, when you're not on television, you're still alive, and <laughs> you're still engaged in the world. And I feel maybe more engaged with the world in a real way now than I ever did sitting on television interviewing politicians and convincing them, you know, I, I had... Do you have any creative projects planned between now oh. and November that have to do with the election, whether it's on the internet? Uh, I, I mean, you know, we're working on technology and animation to try and do sort of interesting uh, li little small bits and, and uh, if we can figure That'll out... That'll go viral. Uh, I, I don't... Again, like, do what you think is good. And if you get 50 likes, great. If you get 500 likes, like... Your life exists outside of television and likes and Instagram, like engage the world. The reason why I was talking about bureaucracy is so my, my wife, who's so much nicer than me, you'd love her. <laughs> um, she uh, is, is uh, we're starting this sanctuary for farm animals. So we had to go before a local Monmouth County Agriculture Board. The epitome of Real America, civic engagement, civic society. The work that these individuals, they were all farmers, the board is 10 farmers. The work that they put into preserving and, and keeping uh, the farm life and, and what they do, their way of life going, was inspiring. If you want to talk about inspiration, we can put it yeah. right on them. There are the, stories there, like the that all over the questions that they, that they uh, that they raised with us were thought-provoking. They helped shape this project in a way that improved it uh, massively. And they dealt with a tremendous amount of paperwork that made no sense to anybody. And they did it with humor and with a certain resignation, but they did it. This must have confounded your lobbyist. Yes, yes. Um, no. but, but the point is, between yeah. now and November, do you expect to surface some projects relative to the election? Oh, uh, it may. <laughs> I, 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 wish, I, I wish I had a better answer. I just don't, I don't know. You know, we're, we're working on it. I'd love to have it ready, you know, by September or something like that, but not necessarily for the election as though that's the D-Day. Like, again... But it's, a, but it's an important time for the country. I, I mean... As I said, like, I'll still... I, I mean, I'll vote. <laughs> I, I don't... In other words, you know... Let me put it this way. The October surprise in this election is not a two-minute cartoon that I'm going to release. Like, the, 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 the powers that be are, are working very diligently. There's, the, the, television has never been more ripe with beautiful satire. There are people from John Oliver to Sam B to Stephen Colbert to uh, uh, Seth Meyers to Trevor to Larry to 
I am so impressed and amazed at the level of uh, insight and wit that is displayed on television uh, every day. It just, uh, you know, it, it, there, is, there is no dearth. Are all great, They're all great. But I, I will say, and we'll wrap it up here. Uh, there's also uh, one John Stewart, and uh, if you move around, people are asking, why isn't he here commenting on this? But we're so lucky that you're here to. I, I, I'm delighted. Talk. You know, I've I've always wanted to uh, be confirmed, and uh, <laughs> yes, this counts, right? Yes. As soon as you put something in the collection. Please. All right, I'll do that. All right, we're going to take some... Uh, yeah, let's take some questions. Thank you for listening to The Axe Files, part of the CNN Podcast Network. For more episodes of The Axe Files, visit cnn.com slash podcast and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite app. And for more programming from the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, visit politics.uchicago.edu. That's that Rockefeller song again. Okay, we're going to take some questions. Uh... I'm glad you came to ask. I thought everybody was leaving. I was like, hey, what? Uh, I don't think the mic is... Uh... Yeah. Thank you oh, so I see. Much. There we go. You're thank coming you. next. I'm sorry. Oh. Thank you for being here. Um, sure. Thinking about this election cycle and the rise of Trump or Sarah Palin's condemnation of Paul Ryan or whatever it is, yeah. are there limits to comedy, the effect that it can have, and are there certain topics that are off limits to political satire? Uh, to the first one, uh, there, no, no topic is, is off limits unless you've got one that you'd like to toss out there. Because I... Uh, because no topics are off limits to life. And I'm still waiting for someone to ask that question to a politician instead of a comic. Because all I ever hear is people always say, where's the line? And they always ask comedians, where's the line? But very rarely do they say to presidents and senators, where's the line? What, which bomb would be the line? So it's always, it's always interesting to me that people think Comedians uh, somehow are the ones that uh, go against, you know, push human nature too far. But the, the actions of our government are somehow we all just kind of I I accept it. And I would say this as far as the efficacy of satire. Uh, I am of the school of Peter Cook, who was a great uh, comedian. Uh, Dudley Moore and Peter Cook were a great team, and he was a, a British comedian. And he was asked once, what is the greatest satire in your mind? Who, who had the greatest satire? And Peter Cook, as normal comedians would when asked that question, would go, uh, bah, bah. and so the, the, the interviewer said, well, I believe it was the, the follies of Berlin in uh, Munich in Berlin in 1938, the rise of the Nazis. And Peter Cook said, yeah, they really showed Hitler. <laughs> And that's how I feel about satire. Hi, thank you so much for coming. My name is Baxter Stein. I'm a second year here in the college. And my question is about policy and comedy. Yeah. And so um, one of your intellectual successors, John Oliver, does a lot of work every week um, you know, advocating for policy change. Yeah. And so I just want to hear more about your philosophy and what the biggest areas of policy are where you think comedy can have a big impact. <laughs> I'll give you, a um, I, you know, I, here, here's the only thing I would say. Shame can be a final gust of wind. It, comedy can't have a, an impact on policy. People can have an impact on policy. Grassroots lobbying, foundational lobbying can have an influence. If, in terms of 9-11 and, and Zadroga, as an example, nine years they worked tirelessly down there at the right moment. It's, it's sort of, you know what it reminds me of? Uh, back to the Future. He built the car, he spent his whole life building that car, and all the guy, one guy had to do was just make the clock hand go to that one thing, that's comedy. You're, you're just, 
at, when the lightning, if there's one moment that could help the guy that has made his life's work something this profound, if you can somehow focus some energy on that in that moment at just the right time, it can be catalyzing, but it in no way can be mistaken for activism. Comedy and satire are an expression. They are an artistic idea. They are not activism. It is, n it is not anything other than a painting, a song, a joke. None of those can change anything. They can occasionally focus a conversation at a crucial moment and help the good work of all the individuals that have put in that time, and I never forget that. Nothing that we ever did meant anything compared to the people on the ground in grassroots who work tirelessly uh, in anonymity against all odds to do what's right and have to do that facing headwinds that shouldn't be there in the first place, that are artificial. John, when you started The Daily Show, when you went to The Daily Show, yep. it was a, a much different show that you inherited than it was more celebrity-oriented or, show. But sure. Did you make a decision right from the beginning that we're going to do political satire and we're going to use the platform where we can be that final ingredient? Or did, no. did this all evolve over time? No. None of it is explicit and conscious. What I made a decision about on The Daily Show when I took it is, I'm not interested in this. I'm interested in this. And if I'm going to spend every day here, 12 hours a day, I want to work on something I'm interested in. And I'm not interested in that. But at no moment was there ever the explicit, we are going to turn this ship to focus here to enact change there. Mm -hmm. It was, that seems boring. That seems interesting. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Brock Hebner. I'm a fourth year student here. Brock, I know who you are. <laughs> Everybody knows the Hebner. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> you knocked the there, question right out of him. There's been so much talent that has come out of The Daily Show with your correspondence. Yeah. And I'm wondering, what about The Daily Show environment in general, or your leadership in particular, do you think led to the growth and development of such talented actors and talk show hosts? Brock. <clears throat> <laughs> when you are a facilitator of men, <laughs> if I may, um, I mean, some of it, honestly, is happenstance. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to identify really talented people and have the pleasure and honor of having them come in and, and work with us. And hopefully the environment was stimulating enough for them and, and, and collaborative enough for them that they were able to express themselves to their best ability. And I think that's, I, I, you know, my feeling about those environments is always simply have a clarity of vision, but a flexibility of process. So the idea being know your intention. You know, it's the one, the only thing that you can ever control is intention. You can't control people's perception of it. You can't control what they make of it, but you can control through your own sense of moral foundation or barometer or whatever it is that, that, that makes you tick, what your intention is. And then you try and execute that intention to its best uh, avatar, to its best self. And, and that's what we would try and do in the show. And we were fortunate to have access to the kind of talent that, that we did. So I don't know that there was anything inherent in the atmosphere as much as in the same way that I felt like talking about issues in politics would make it more interesting, we were able to find performers that also felt that way. And together, that created, I think, a, a certain energy for part of the process. Cameraman has a question? Oh, no, that was there. All right. Uh, hi. I just wanted to go back to uh, earlier you were talking about the media and how they kind yes. of have twisted incentives. Yeah. And I was uh, wondering how we could really go about changing those incentives, the focus on clarity over a conflict, like you said, kind of stray away from the Fox business model. 
Um, well, it's not, I, 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 the one thing I would say is it's not just the Fox business model. I think it's the business model. Fox has found a way to work their ideology into the business model, which I think is, you know, having your cake and eating it too. CNN doesn't have an ideology uh, other than, you know, narrating the news as it happens outside without knowing why. Um, <laughs> MSNBC would like to have the, the clarity of their ideology mesh with uh, making money, but uh, so far, that hasn't just worked out. Um, but I think, again, news isn't just another, as in the same way that I view healthcare, it's just not another commodity that is placed on your cable box. And I think the concerted effort has to be is to remove it from that system, to not necessarily, to try and create a 24-hour news network that can be a powerful counterweight, a, a Fox News of veracity, where uh, it's not so reliant on uh, the daily exigencies of, of ratings and such, but is still good television and is still interesting. And I think it can be, I think it can be done. When you and I were uh, kids, there were three networks, uh, three major networks. Everybody watched sort of the same news and so on. Now that the media environment is completely Balkanized and right. uh, and people tend to seek out the media media that affirm their views rather than necessarily inform uh, their views. Is that unhealthy? I mean, how do you get people well, I think to people listen in to general, each other? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know of people that don't live that way normally, and you know, I don't think that's a common like modern phenomenon that people tend to. Uh, congregate with like-minded people. I don't know if you, you, you ate lunch in high school, right? Like, it's not, it's not like in high school you sought out like, today I'm going to sit with the stoner kids no. and find out what they think about Pink Floyd. Like, people tend to, <laughs> people tend to go with people that they're like-minded. What I would say about media today is that maybe you're in a bubble, but generally little bits of other people's bubbles find their way into yours. And that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's good. But you need a bubble-making machine. You need a machine that makes good bubbles and is constantly putting them out there and popping other people's shitty bubbles. So, but I would suggest that while there is this sort of epistemic closure that you talk about, because of the volume of material being generated and the tenacity of the material being generated, there's a lot of cross-pollination. And so people are much more aware of that's part of what globalization is about. And that's part of what fuels the anger of globalization is there's a lot of people in a lot of places who go, who just found out, oh, we're getting fucked. We didn't even know that. And now we do. So again, every technology has the ability to elevate and the ability to denigrate. And I'm saying that when it comes to news, and again, this is an exercise of editorial authority. This is subjective. There is no objectivity here. It is subjective. You know, but, you know, the internet has the ability to elevate discussion. It also has the ability to just, look, I read the comment sections just like everybody else. Like, I just found out just because I have a gray beard that I have cancer or AIDS. Like, that's the comment section. What happened to John Stewart? He has cancer or AIDS. He has CADES, cancer AIDS. Like, I don't know. Like, that's just what it is. That being said, that's not unusual. Like, what is the biggest thing on the internet? It's porn. The internet can illuminate or you can just jerk off to it. Like, that's just <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell, man. He invented the telephone. Watson, come quickly and bring a towel. Like, that's what it is. <laughs> like, that's everything that a man makes, everything that we have can be used for good or evil. Atomic energy, you can cut it one way and light the world. You can cut it another way and blow the world up. Like, yeah. that's the dilemma we face. So use your energy towards as much as you can towards the positive. Hi, I'm Melissa. I'm a second year in the college. Uh, so I know you spoke a little bit before about how comedy is just comedy. It's just satire. Um, but a few... I don't, I don't, I, I, I should probably, I don't mean it's just satire like it's a trifle. I'm really proud of it. I think, it's, I think it's an amazing way to express yourself. 
I meant that it cannot take the place of activism. So I don't mean it as a sense of, it's just jokes, folks. It's not. Satire is an expression of my true beliefs. Put through the prism. The reason why it's not news is the tools of satire I, are hyperbole and pun and denigration, you know, shit you can't get away with with news. But the expression of it may have a similar foundation. So I apologize for that. Well, on that note, um, yeah. there were a few criticisms and articles about John Oliver and Trevor Noah's work um, in doing satire and talking about how they're basically doing the work of journalists in order to illuminate different issues. Do you see the world of comedy skewing more towards a comedy journalism hybrid in any way? Uh, I see the world of journalism skewing more towards comedy. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I feel like they're moving towards our box. Um, no, I mean, I think part of, you know, there is a certain form of, what we did on the, on, the, on the Daily Show was we took a sort of short form content and we tried to create a more essayistic version of that, utilizing principles of, of argument with, you know, and, and logic with, with the comedy. What that requires at times is a certain balance of foundational material, background. And without that background, it, it wouldn't make, an essay doesn't make much sense without its premise statements and things. So, so that's where that comes from. But I don't think, you know, people will get tired. It, art is always evolving into a, a lot of different ways. Um, but that particular form, comedy general, generally requires a shared set of knowledge with its audience. So in the days of great scandal, that's sweeping through the country, those jokes are easy because when Dick Cheney shot a guy in the face, that was an easy show to write. Because <laughs> everybody knew Dick Cheney shot a guy in the face. So you didn't really have to go through a whole thing of like, in 1972, Congress passed the Don't Shoot Your Friends Act. <laughs> now, here's where, like, it was kind of like, it was right there. <laughs> so it was, comedy tries to require the least amount of distance between your brain and your gut. So when you have to fill that in, it can tend to detract from it. So it makes it difficult. So to be able to do that, like guys like Oliver, I, I really admire their ability to do that. But I don't think, it's, I don't think that's the new thing. Uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Mary McNicholas, oh. and I grew up watching your show nightly. Um, but but wait, you're a full-grown person. <laughs> that would make me 80. <laughs> I actually had to watch um, tape shows to see your first couple years on air. Um, when, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't come here to insult you, I promise. No, 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 that doesn't at all. I know I'm old. <laughs> um, but you focused a lot more on pop culture then. And yeah. my question is just, when did that shift happen? And was, was it a shift because you saw the need to shift to cover politics? Or was it more natural because you thought, hey, that's interesting? Um, in the early years of the show, it was more that it was a struggle with the editorial, um, with the network. They were, I think, more of the mindset that people liked the pop culture. And I was more of the mindset that we could create something uh, slightly different that would still bring in viewership. I think they were, they were feeling like we would be narrowing our focus economically and uh, so it the, and, and those shifts generally take time but it wasn't that that's all it was was that that fight had to be fought oh can I follow up are you glad that 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 you won that fight are you glad that this has been your role that you've become oh um, I'm glad that that I did because you know I've been fired a lot from a lot of places and <laughs> that if I didn't if, if the ratings didn't go up I would have been fired so I am, I am glad. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a first year in the college, and we're pretty similar in the fact that we're both Jews from Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Are you really from Lawrenceville? Yeah. Hey, what are you doing there? <laughs> I don't know. You, like, there's a little plaque in the hallway outside the auditorium in the high school that says John Leibowitz on it. Yeah, yeah. Is that, um, what's that for? Smoking pot? What, what, what did I get it for? <laughs> It says like media on it along with the oh, all right. people that were yeah, like, man. famous for nothing. I have a plaque at Lawrence High School. Yeah. Is it still kind of a shithole? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Very yeah. Nice. Very related, nice related to that, because yeah. you're like the one famous person from our town, how do you think <laughs> that um, 
the shit show that is New Jersey politics and just the state itself has affected your work. Interesting. <clears throat> um, surely New Jersey having a comic level of corruption in it uh, ha has brought to bear, but to be truthful, I was not- Welcome to Illinois, by the way. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> But in Illinois, I think you have a better chance of going to prison. If, if, if you drop out of high school, you have less of a chance of going to prison than if you become governor. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I think, honestly, Watergate and Vietnam were the, the crucibles by which uh, my, my mindset was shaped much more than, uh, you know, New Jersey, which <laughs> is a whole other set of problems. <laughs> Hi, uh, so my name is Mark. I'm a big fan of the show, and I'm actually very lucky because I'll be interning at The Daily Show this summer. Hey, congratulations. Thank you. That'll be nice. Uh, so this is more of a work advice. You know what? I, can I say this? Yeah. Practice washing fruit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, Just want to make sure you know the gig. So my question is, um, how do you keep your sanity amid the onslaught of 24-hour news networks right. like for your job? Well, I think, were you, were you here the whole time? <laughs> you don't. Um, it's, it's a lot like, you remember the movie The Green Mile? Where you're like, you know, you, you, people get lost in it. And I think you begin to think that it's real life. And uh, you have to understand that when you watch it, it's designed for a reason. And the reason is to heighten urgency and anxiety so that you won't turn away. And you can begin to think that that's, that that's real, but it's, it's, it's not. So just keep that in mind. And Xanax. <laughs> oh, no. Go ahead. But, yep. Fantastic. So, Senate Republicans have done a pretty effective job in not confirming uh, Merrick Garland for the <laughs> Supreme Court. And now that the media has shifted their attention to November, do you think that the, let's wait until the next president chooses the justice, do you think that argument is valid now that there's six months until the election? And what's your prediction on, you know, who's going to fill the seat? First of all, don't threaten me with those boxing gloves on your arm. I know what's going on. <laughs> I swear to God, I All got right. hit by a truck on Friday, so I'm thankful Wait, to Wait, you. you got hit by a truck? Yes. <laughs> well, let me just say this. The Merrick Garland question is interesting, but the truck story <laughs> is fucking phenomenal. How did you get hit by a truck? Uh, let's just say that Hyde Park has some reckless drivers. Oh, right, it was the driver <laughs> in Hyde Park, and in no way you stoned on a unicycle. <laughs> All right, here's, here's the question. So, I have no idea. And as far as I'm concerned, they're fucking themselves, because the vote that's not there is, the only, is one of the only reliably conservative votes. So any case that's coming up through this next year that was going to be a 5-4 decision for the conservatives is now moot. So basically, they're going to spend a year losing pretty much any case they had a shot with. So I don't know what to tell them. Take one more question. Yeah. Yes. Me? Yes, sir. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> I... Brothers in beards. Thank you. It's a new one. I'm trying it out. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the last interview on your show, which I think was Louis C.K. Yeah. Uh, so from my memory, I think that was after some of the rumors about Louis C.K.'s alleged harassment of female comedians Whoa. that sort of started to come out. Um, it was just a thing circulating Wait, on the internet. What? Uh, I think this was after Jen Kirkman, for example, had talked about uh, like her knowledge of Louis C.K.'s alleged harassment of female comedians. Um, right. At least people interpreted yeah. it that way. There was an ar article on um, Gawker, I believe, about it. Right. And I just wanted to know, I mean, if, if this is the first you're hearing of it, I, maybe my answer's already, I, I already got my answer that there oh, really okay. wasn't discussion about this on the show, but... Um, <laughs> I, so wait, wait, wait. I, I'm, I'm a little lost. On yeah. the, the, so the internet said Louis harassed women. 
So there was first a Gawker article, and then there was um, a couple of tweets by people. And I know this is all <laughs> internet it's stuff. Pretty authoritative. I know that this is how. You know who you're talking to, right? No, uh, I, I right. totally get that, and right. it's a fair point that like internet rumors are not, uh, you know, court cases or anything. Um, I just wanted to know if there was any sort of discussion about that on the show, if that was a thing on your radar. No. Um, I I, I, I didn't. I didn't see the tweets. No, but, or, um, or Jen Kirkman's podcast about. I, I don't. About I, this. you know, and I, I apologize. I honestly like. I'm not that connected to that world, so I, I do apologize. Uh, I, I don't know what you're talking about, but. Um, sure. But. Uh, no, and, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, and I, I, I can't really, I don't know what no, to definitely. say. No, definitely, and I can, I can turn that around, and I think that's a good point, is that a lot of people at the time didn't know what that was, and, you know, at, again, like, the internet is not uh, for sure or anything like that, but just there are, there have been comedians who have taken strong, strong stances on Bill Cosby without, like, certain knowledge, uh, from Bill Maher to Hannibal Burris. But I just wonder if you could talk about the role of comedians in... But as you, point, as you, pointed, as you pointed out, right. the Bill Cosby case actually is a legal case. Now it is, but it wasn't when Bill Maher and Hannibal Burris started talking about it. I just, maybe, if you can right. speak to the role of comedians in... I mean, I, I can, all I can tell you is I've, I've worked with Louis for 30 years, and, like, he's a wonderful man and person, and I've never heard anything about this, and... Sure. We've all known Bill Cosby was a prick for a long time, so I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so I, but I didn't know about the the sexual assault. But but you're right, it, it's important. I, not to, sexual assault, or, or, or uh, like whatever. Just harassment in general. Pre oh, appreciate okay. your yeah, question. Thank yeah. you. Thank Sorry. you. I, I, and let's and let's say thanks to John Stewart. Oh, thank you.